All right, we are live now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are happy that you are joining us today for our second speaker series event of the 2023-2024 speaker series. And before I introduce today's talk and speaker, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we gather, the University of Alberta and the Center for, for Criminological Research respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory today, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoda Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Today, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Vicky Chartrand. I'm going to butcher your last name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> She's a full professor um, in the sociology department at Bishop's University in Quebec. Um, and also an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa um, in the criminology department. She's also the founder and director of the um, Justice, Center for Justice Exchange, um, a research center for collaborative community justice, uh, justice research at Bishop's University. And her research includes mapping carceral and colonial intersections, um, unearthing community grassroots justices, and advancing community-engaged collaborative methodologies. Um, Vicky has over 25 years of experience collaborating with women and children, indigenous communities, and people in prison, and we are so pleased to have you with us today. Um, before I give it over to Vicky, I just want to remind everyone that um, you can keep your cameras off uh, or you can turn them on. And at the end of Vicky's talk, you'll have the chance to ask your questions directly. And if you are joining us via YouTube today, then you can type your questions into the chat and we will feed them to Vicky um, in the Zoom call. And without further ado, Vicky, over to you. That's amazing. Well, thanks for that introduction and thanks for inviting me, everyone. And it's great to have everyone here. I appreciate all the, the time and energy that goes into organizing these events. And I think that's also often these invisible labor. But I'm I'm actually currently, I live and work on the Abenaki, the beautiful Abenaki territory. And it's an honor and privilege for me to be here. So as Sandra was saying, I, I actually have, I've been a community engaged researcher uh, for almost 20 years. Uh, and with varying Indigenous communities, and I find lately, and I'm probably sure folks, uh, you guys do as well, that um, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, interest in this area lately, and particularly in the po after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and certainly in the post-pandemic with Black Lives Matters movement, uh, there's been a real growing interest in this work, which is great, but I also think there's a real danger there. Um, because realistically, we also know that Indigenous peoples in Canada, as elsewhere, they're, they're overstudied, uh, voices are appropriated, altered or not heard, and that their research often serves the ends of the researchers and even within colonial projects. So um, Vine Deloria actually argues that this kind of traditional research approach often reduces people and world phenomena into sterile abstractions, and organizes storytelling rituals by only a select group of people and predominantly folks like me, like researchers. And so in short, in settler research, as I call it, it produces stories, I'll be very powerful stories that are invasive, extractive, and often self-serving. So, and I find that even within some of the, the new, some of the more emerging methodologies that depart from these dominant research trajectories, such as participatory action research, or even collaborative ethnography, the colonial relationship can also be reinforced with there's often an implicit assumption that research functions as a type of rescue of some sort. So McKintrick, for example, she points out that in her analysis of academic concepts like marginalizing and oppressed, they often reaffirm the hierarchies of imperial culture and knowledge production as the mainstream uh, as the mainstream form of knowledge production and that everything else is, uh, is ancillary. So um, having encountered many critiques and claims of legit legitimacy, so how can or should uh, settler research in Indigenous country take shape? 
So um, and it's something that I often ask myself is throughout the trajectory of my, my own work and research. And to attend to this question and address some of the problems that I see associated with settler research, I map out uh, some of the tenets that I've learned along the way and that I've adopted in my own work. And I'll do that particularly through a research project I'm involved in called Unearthing Justices. And what that is, is it's a collaborative research project to document, share, and showcase Indigenous grassroots initiatives for the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people. So as I, um, as I talk about these tenants, what I'll do is I'll uh, elaborate on that project as I go along. So in this work, I, I really like to locate research within a broader set of relations and as an exchange in the sharing of resources, knowledge, and life worlds. And so I refer to this approach as a, a sort of methodological ontology of a relational accountability and collaborative methods. And so that's what I would like to talk with you at, with you find folk today. So what I um, offer here, uh, it's not a methodological prescription or a recipe, but it really it's like, how can we weave in research into other people's life worlds um, and the like? So, uh, so the first tenant I wanna begin with, and I think it's probably, and all these tenants are, of course, they're interrelated and, and, they, and they're sort of scaffolded into one another, but this work really begins and ends with community. You have to be in community. And I, and I feel like you, you have to be a part of some kind of community. And my community, um, as I see it, and as I feel belonging to, is one is prison community. I started um, going into prisons 25 years ago on a volunteer basis. And today, through the Center of Justice Exchange, we receive hundreds of emails from people in prison. And I, and I get phone calls almost on a daily basis from folks inside, and actually predominantly from Indigenous folks as well. So that's one of my communities. But the other community that I'm going to talk about today is... Um, the family and community members of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And so it's these communities that I often find myself in these kinds of circles. I'm collaborating with them uh, through ongoing uh, rapport, but I also have personal, uh, personal relationships and carrying out research. And I think that um, research, and as a researcher, we often see it as something that we choose to do. And Lauren Tynan, she's a Turoe woman in Australia, she points out that knowledge is not produced by those carrying out research, but is shared with us by country. And I thought it was, I thought that really helped me frame my understanding of the kind of work I was doing because it was not, research was never something that I just chose or stepped into, but rather it, I, I, I engaged in this kind of work because a space was made, uh, a space was made for me. So I'll give you an example of that. So with the Unearthing Justices Project, we've collated over 500 grassroots uh, Indigenous-led, Indigenous-based initiatives for the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And we've, you know, and this, this spans the realm from, you know, you have Sisters Watch in, uh, in, Van, in the downtown east side that does a wraparound service for, for the women who, who, who live and work there. There's a woman in Portage La Prairie who offers safe passage. You have uh, all kinds of bear clan patrols and wolf patrols that span, that span the country that, that do community safety rather than policing. Um, you have Drag the Red in Winnipeg uh, and, and, other, and there's so many other initiatives. And we, we've collated over 500 initiatives and what it started to highlight for us was um, the incredible and tremendous outpouring of resource and energy that exists in communities. And all of this is uh, without any support or resource. And it helped us, for me, it helped to highlight a lot, a lot of the things that justice is and needs. Mourning, sharing, safety, shelter, accountability, remembering, supporting, ceremony, healing, educating, growing. Right, so it, it it starts to help us span a much broader conceptualizing of what justice is outside of of some of the more traditional criminal justice approaches. But where that where this kind of um, idea took root was actually years and years ago when I worked at a women's shelter in if anyone's familiar with in in, uh, in Quinell, British Columbia, and I, I met uh, Gladys Raddick, who's a Gitsan Wet'suwet'en woman. 
And she was on one of her national walks across the country. In fact, Gladys has done uh, five national walks across the country, spanning over 3,000 kilometers, taking over three months, and um, where she's raising awareness for the missing American Indigenous women. So that's when I first met Gladys, and then um, I ended up moving to Ottawa, and I was at a Take Back the Night march uh, on Capitol Hill, and who was there but Gladys Radek? And I'm like, wow, this woman is like dynamic. I need to work with her. So I, I approached her, and we started collaborating and working. And in fact, I ended up helping her um, or supporting her work for her fifth national walk. And that could be like meeting, uh, we did things like meeting dignitaries, holding fundraisers, helping her with her war pony. And I'll tell you about her war pony a little bit in a moment um, and, and all the like. So that's where I felt like a space was made for me to do this kind of work. And it was in doing this work with her that I realized the, tre the tremendous amount of resource that exists in community. So I think when a space like this is made for us to step into, we're better able to see our roles and responsibilities in the research. Uh, and we can see what we ourselves as researchers in our, in our situatedness uh, can bring in that exchange. And this brings me to my second tenet. And I think, I think in this work, we often go in with good intentions. And I think that's great. But instead of just thinking about how we could do more good, I, I think we need to also be thinking about how we can do less harm. And you can do that when uh, you can think about doing less harm when you belong to a community and there's accountability there. So um, I go back to the teachings, uh, Niga and Sinclair gave some teachings. I was at a conference at the University of Winnipeg on, uh, he was giving teachings on land acknowledgements. And he was talking about how acknowledging the land's not about just acknowledging the people of the land, but it's actually establishing your relationship and your responsibility to the people and the land. And so I feel like a, a relational accountability in research, it's not you know, helping or saving or doing good, but it's to see our roles and responsibilities and to balance our collective knowledge and gifts within the communities we find ourselves. Um, so to highlight that, uh, the first stage or one of the parts of that uh, Unearthing Justice project was uh, a cross-country road trip with Gladys. After we had, after her fifth walk, we, we eventually did a cross-country road trip. And this, to talk to the families and community members of all the amazing work they were doing. And so we did uh, about 20 days uh, traveling over 10,000 kilometers, talking to uh, 30 families and community members. And then we did uh, some follow-up interviews and then some additional interviews in the pandemic period over, over video. So part of my work or part of what I I've, I've, I've thought that bringing in uh, the research piece was in this here was the, the documenting and the witnessing that it did. And uh, along this cross-country trip, um, and I say, I use her, her name and story with permission, was uh, Chickadee had mentioned, talked about how every time a woman goes missing from our communities, we don't just lose a loved one, but we also lose all the beautiful gifts and strengths of, of that woman and that she brought to the community. And, and, and that, that, that quote struck, it was pivotal in terms of that understanding of that relational accountability, that it's not just something we're researching, but it's that we're a part of that research. And, and we bring in just like anyone of a community brings in important strengths and resources. So a relational accountability is to locate yourself within the context of your own life and work and mobilize your resources, gifts, strengths, and spirit in a way that can support, advance, transfer, and build up the communities you work with, but that you're also a part of as well. So I think this brings me to my third tenet then, which is so, uh, social location matters a lot. So it's not enough to just know your role and responsibility. You also need to know where you're located within all of this, because. Um, Research brings its own sort of ethic of care. Uh, Eileen Morton Robinson points out that our cultural and social positioning informs how, when, where, and why we conduct research. So in the last part of this project, it consisted of um, 
of the Unearthing Justice Project consists of reading more than uh, 2,380 uh, cross-country public hearings and evidence gathering testimonies of the family members, survivors of violence, the experts, and knowledge keepers of the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So I, I spent a good part of the year um, reading these transcripts and, and I gotta be honest, I, I probably just cried for that entire year. And the the thing about that though is that, you know, the collective toll and hardship and violence is, is unfathomable, especially from me as an outsider, as a researcher, it's, it's unfathomable. So uh, it, I thought it's really important and that, that helped highlight to me where my, what my role is uh, as a researcher uh, in relation to this work. So the final report of the uh, National Inquiry is actually called Reclaiming Power in Place. And, and I did come across uh, a woman who talked about power in place. And I'll read the quote from the transcripts, which are publicly available, by the way. So it's, um, she says, as, an, as a woman, as an Indigenous woman, for me, it's really about power in place. And without power in place and recognition and provision of the same, we're not able to fulfill our responsibilities as who we are in our communities. And Deloria, Vine Deloria argues that relations are all about power in place and power being the living energy that inhabits or in composes the universe and place being the relationship of things to each other. So when a space, uh, as a researcher, when a space is made for us and we recognize our power in place within it, the researcher has something to offer through the very process of research itself. So the Unearthing Justices Project right now, after harnessing, after doing this three-tiered uh, work, what, we, what we're doing is we're actually collaborating with a web developer, uh, and I'm going to give them a shout out right now uh, because they're amazing to work with. It's House 9 Design in Montreal. So we're working with these uh, website developers to actually now uh, uh, to uh, share and showcase all this amazing work on a website. And so I think that there is a place for research, but we have to make sure that it's, it's, in, in account, it's in a relational accountability to the people that we're in community with. So the research itself has something to author through the very process of research itself. And that could be um, you know, documenting, collating and analyzing information, mobilizing knowledge, amplifying voices, standing witness, providing research materials, acknowledging, listening. So it, it has a lot of things to offer, but I think it's important that we understand that um, uh, within our institutional role, research also exercises a substantive access to mainstream resources and institutional influence. And that can be important for communities in a way without polluting or diluting the important work that's already being done. And, and I think this brings me to my fourth tenet. I think I'm at four, if I can count properly. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, and this is associated a lot more with the works of uh, Eve Tuck and the like, but that communities and similar literature, but that communities are not damaged. Um, and I think that in research, and you, you hear this a lot, at least in the people who um, approach me to, to get involved is that there's an implicit assumption that the research encounter is a kind of rescue or a recover or repair some kind of deficit or damage. And that's often mediated through researchers, of, you know, and white bodies. And you might hear some, that's a reference to Sierra Hartman here. And it's important, communities are not damaged and far from it. And I want to give you a really good example of that. Uh, so this is where I talk about Gladys's war pony. So what she does is she she takes the images with permission of the families of um, women and two spirit who are missing, and she posts them on her car, or what she calls her war pony. And so she drives as she drives across the country with her war pony, that it helps highlight these kinds of search initiatives. And so when we did this cross country road trip, we we were in many towns and cities, and um, most people would just kind of look on at the at the war pony in, in an almost a voyeuristic way, in fact. And, and they'd, some people might ask questions when we stopped at a gas station, but that was the extent of it. But when we went into Indigenous communities um, or on reserve, that people would come up to us, Glass would get out, they would shake her hand, they'd thank her for all the work she's done. They would 
speak to some of the photos on the on on the war pony they would talk about and share some of their own personal stories uh, with lost ones and uh, in addition to that they would they would offer us free food gas free lodging uh, free accommodation right it was just a, a tremendous outpouring of resource for ostensibly communities that are lacking or in need of some kind of saving which is often with the research research somewhat often assumes, yeah, at least at least in the stuff that I've been reading over the course of quite a few years. So I think we need to see and prioritize the idea that important work is already happening in, in communities and that research itself can unearth and harness that in a really significant way. So we depart from the idea that research itself is emancipatory, but rather a tool among many others to support Indigenous intellectual sovereignty and self-determination. All right, so just on, uh, just on a final point that, that I think is really important to share on in some of the ways that I've done my work and what I've learned from it is if it's not messy, confusing, and personally destabilizing, you're likely doing something wrong. And I think that, you know, we often think that research needs to go well and succeed. And, you know, Kim Talbert points out that um, research doesn't have to have a positive end goal, but it can hold just some kind of unknown quality. So research in this way uh, grows with our encounters and activities and is in alignment with those who we are in community with. So for me, this process, we are learning how to transform some of the, for, um, for me in this process, we're learning how to transform some of the more stable and coherent research narratives and practices. So I think overall, just to summarize, it's from these important understandings and approaches that the Unearthing Justice's uh, research project pivots to rethink the relations of research as a collaborative exchange and relational accountability. And just to conclude, you know, I get it and, and I get it wrong all the time. And what I've learned that is um, a collective, a collectivity of people's lives, including my own, are carrying the decisions we make and the ideas and activities we project into this world. So we can't afford to get it wrong, but we do. And that's okay. I think our life's work always carries uh, more opportunities for learning, cultivating, and growing. And this kind of approach, even though it's messy, confusing, and personally destabilizing, um, this, uh, this kind of approach to our life's work nurtures us beyond, uh, beyond what research or the academy could ever offer. So I just want to thank you all for your collective presence and, and witnessing. Thank you so, so much, Vicky. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah? People can hear me? Okay. Well, thank you so much for the fascinating talk. Um, this is actually really inspiring, and I'm sure we'll have lots of questions in the audience. As I said, you can either raise your hand, you can turn your camera on if you feel comfortable. Um, and uh, or you can type into in uh, type the question into the chat in which case i can read them or jeff will feed me the questions from youtube if there are any questions so the audience the floor is open for everyone um just let me know who would like to go first Well, as people are thinking um, and taking a moment, I can ask you a question. And this is really more coming from, uh, as, as you might know, my um, my early work is coming from a you know ethnographic tradition. I did lots of ethnographic work back in Germany. And many of the things um, that you're talking about um, in terms of how we build relationships with communities um, are very similar for good ethnography or that should be practiced in good in any good ethnography i think um but but i always feel that um you know approaching indigenous uh, in approaching um topics from an from an indigenous methodological standpoint are seen as different from general ethnography um 
and and this may be my ignorance, but I always wonder what exactly the difference is because many of the things, as I said, that you, that you're talking about regarding building relationships and and doing so respectfully, I I think should be part of any research, regardless what you do. So I don't know if you have any any comments or thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a, what, a, what a good question. Um, yeah, so I've done traditional ethnography and, I, and I, I have to be honest that my approach when I first started this work wouldn't have been, wasn't the same as when I, it is now in terms of how, how I do this and carry out this work. But one of the things with, um, uh, this approach, and especially in Indigenous community, is, is the rapport and relationality. Um, you, you spend a lot of time, um, I guess it's, it's in the work and the labor that you do. You spend a lot of time uh, support, uh, what should I say, volunteering, working, listening, and ceremony. So there's a lot of behind the scenes work that I don't think, and over the course of years and years. So one of the things, for example, when in talking to Gladys, She'd be like, you know, Vicky, you're one of the few that stayed as long as you have. And in so doing, you, you garner a much more longer term, deeper understanding, and you start to see and pivot from, uh, from that work uh, what, your, what your role is in, in that community and what your relationship is to are to those people. And I don't think that ethnography has that same, necessarily same kind of commitment, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not just, I, I think it depends on the, on the ethnographer and the types of relationships that they're, they're building. I, I don't see it in all ethnographic work, but I, I, I tend to think that it should be part of everyone's approach. Yeah. Yeah. And it may be, it may just be, um, I'm highlighting a different kind of ethnographic approach. I don't mm -hmm. know many ethnographers who feel a part of that community, who feel responsible to that community in ways that they themselves are impacted when things go wrong. And not that in a way that's like, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say another quote that, uh, that I get, and this was, and I share this again with permission, but Bernie Williams uh, in the downtown East side, she often talks about, um, you know, that it's not a nine to five job and it's something that we can walk away from and which which is absolutely true like you know even for myself like I can walk away from it but that I, I remain committed and responsible as well without without um without these kinds of tangential relationships with individuals anyway hard to say thank thank you and I see Dari um, yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. This uh, was really fascinating. Um, yeah, and I do have a question about, um, you know, from your personal stance or, um, you know, research-wise or methodology-wise, as well as like structure-wise, like what are the challenges that you have faced and how you, um, and how you over came those challenges or are you still in the process of overcoming those challenges and at the same time um what are the benefits like are the, the like is it um do you feel it personally beneficial or like like doing good about something that you care about and um you know can you um tell a little bit about like challenges and then uh benefits maybe and and you've touched a little upon on um, um, exiting the field or, you know, leaving the research side. Um, so could you elaborate on that a little bit? I know there's a lot of questions <laughs> which are not formulated very well, but um, yeah, like as, as you talked about your research and the conceptualization of your research, I kept wondering yeah, so thanks. Really good questions. And I and I think I understand them. I, I think I understand what you're asking. I mean, I, I'll be the biggest challenge for me, and, and, and I think probably for most researchers, but oh God, I, this is where Vicky being too honest is a problem. But um I feel like in, in, when you're doing this kind of work, when you're working with folks who don't have the traditional means and access to these kinds of institutions, 
you, you have to like beg, borrow and steal like that. That That's kind of like a mantra of mine. Like it'd be impossible to look because what you're, you know, just if you're, if you're going through ethics, like to get ethics approved. Like, so what, for me, the biggest challenge is institutional bureaucracy. Like ethics is really important. Don't get me wrong. But I, do I think that um, traditional ethics bodies have a, have a good understanding of community engaged research in order to be able to navigate the ethical field in a way that's going to be, helpful for community, not necessarily. And so you have these big technical long worded contracts that, you know, if you're an indigenous person, like there's no way you're gonna trust that a long winded contract. Like that's that's treaty that were treaties that were broken. Do you know what I mean? So there's those are the those become the kinds of problems and obstacles that I have to that I feel like a lot of folks who are doing this kind of research are um are up are working up against. Um, we were, you know, just recently we were working through procurement process, and because we were working with an Indigenous-based community, they didn't have the resources to have the proper kinds of security mechanisms in place for their um, for their digital platform. So we couldn't, again, so we couldn't work with them, even though we were trying to work do do this work within community. Uh, so those would be the the biggest challenges that I think uh, I think anyone would be coming up against, uh, you know, uh, in this kind of work. And then the thing, the benefits, I mean, uh, this is where I, when I start to talk about um, social location matters a lot, like I benefit from this work as a researcher. My, my career benefits from this. I advance, uh, you know, I get promotion. And But in an understanding at the same time, what I'd like to do is I like to utilize that institutional influence in order to, you know, for example, give talks at the University of Alberta to talk about this really important, amazing work that's happening to like all the people here. Like so, so that becomes um, that's part of. So I do benefit professionally, but at the same time, as I'm benefiting, I'm also mobilizing that in in ways that are beneficial to the community as well. And so this is where I spend a lot of time. You know, just today I was talking to someone on the phone about about this talk and what would be beneficial to expressing and communicating and the like. So um, you're always um, you're not researching per se. You're always strategizing and you're in you're in conversation all the time, and that that feeds my. I mean, it's it's for sure time consuming, but it feeds my soul, and it feeds my soul in the sense of again with social location. And I don't want to be macabre and get get into detail around it but you know I, I experienced a lot of violence when I was growing up and um uh so I come at this as an anti-violence worker so it's 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 um part of my own healing and understanding of uh, my work is in my own life is through my work and I think we would be naive to to not well I don't want to call you naive I would be naive to think that it didn't have something to do with that what I, why I was drawn into the anti-violence field. So when I met Gladys, I was working at a, um, a woman's shelter. You know, like it's, it's pretty, it, it's those, the liens, sorry, the links and, and the parallels are, are there. But I, I also see that, you know, um, those parallels between the violence experience from, you know, whether it's prison, Indigenous women, but also like when children experience violence and the like, there's all the parallels between that violence. And it's important to highlight and understand that in, in those ways. And then finally, uh, I think, what did you say? Uh, leaving the field. Um, God, I don't leave the field. I, I've never left the field. Like I've, I've never not, this is my life work. And, and, and it's, I call it work. I, I don't know why I call it work. It's, I don't have another word for it, word for it. but um, like I said, so I, I get, I take, I, I take phone calls from people in prison. They're, they're in crisis. They need a pen pack, <laughs> whatever is happening. Um, you know, someone just needs someone to talk to every week. And it's just, this, this makes me feel like I'm, you know, I just, I just, for me, it's like, uh, I feel like A, I, I'm contributing. I have something to offer, but B, I learn so much from that. Every phone call I get, every time I intervene, every time I'm I, I, I'm learning from it. I'm growing from it. So, and it benefits my work because it informs my discourse. It informs my framework of understanding the world and, and the research that I do. So again, it goes back to that, that collaborative methodology. Like I recognize, in fact, I called, uh, I called it the Center for Justice Exchange because I realized that as we were providing resource and information, 
I was learning more. Like I was probably benefiting more by the tremendous resource that information that was being shared with me from people from the inside. Does that answer? I hope I answered your question. Yes, this was really great. Thank you so much. You've answered all my questions, um, though they were poorly formulated. No, but, they're perfect. Yeah, like we, we, we do read a lot um, about Indigenous methodologies in our classes, and now it's really great to have somebody to speak about these methodologies and their own experiences, as well as to see how like your life work forms your um, way of understanding the world. It's yeah. inspirational. Thank you. Thank you, Dari. Um, I do see Justin's hand, but Justin, I also have some uh, students who um, type their questions. So I will take one of those first. Um, so this is a question from L'Oreal and she says, Thanks so much for your talk, Vicky. You mentioned something interesting about it being inevitable that researchers will make mistakes while working within community and that making these okay mistakes is okay. I'm wondering though, how have you navigated both making and repairing these mistakes while in community? How can researchers be accountable when they do mistakes? Yeah, that's a big <laughs> question and a big question. Um, Hey, just to give you an example, and sometimes you can't repair. Like I was talking to a woman, a Haida, Haida woman, and uh, I, I, I was framing it in a way about me. Like I'm like, oh, I don't think I want to. I don't think I don't think we should go this way. And she's like, it's not about you and what you want. It's about what what our work and what we're doing. And she was 100 right. And then she's like, I just need to take a break from you. And and I'm, I'm like, okay. And, and and she did. She's taken. She's taken. I think she's taken a permanent break from me, which is is okay because you're you're in that intensity of the work and you have these ideas of what of what's happening and and what what you think should happen. And sometimes you make big mistakes, and and that's and that's only just once. Like you know, Gladys and I have have had um, had 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 conflicts and encounters, but we we you know, if I can be honest, we love each other. We love each other, and so we we keep we'll we'll. we'll part ways for a little bit or stop talking for a little bit, but then we always come back to the table and she, you know, and that's, that's because that's what happens when you're in community with people that you're in relationship with you, um, especially, you know, because you, you, you tend to build close and proximate relationships so that um, the closer you are in a proximate relationship is um, the easier it is to repair. The, the other thing too, though, is in, in making those kinds of mistakes. And I think I probably didn't highlight this enough in my, in my talk is that, um, the work I did is um, was only because uh, community. Uh, I was brought into community. Like you know, glad no one would have talked to me if Gladys didn't um, wasn't part of this uh, project. You know, because she has such a tremendous respect from the family and community members. So she she brokered those relationships. And if it so, it's really about um, so if I when I do make a mistake that I, you know, I apologize, we ask, and you know, like, well, can, and sometimes you just, uh, you know, I apologize, I, I apologize a lot, and I call, I call myself an asshole, it's part of my expression, but, you know, like, it's, because I, and, and I probably lack a little bit, I, I, I lack a little bit, um, I, I don't have all too, I'm a little, maybe humble, what's, what's the word, I lack, um, I don't know what's the word, Anyway, I'm an asshole. That's all I can say. And so in being an asshole, you're okay admitting that you make mistakes like, you know, so that, that's part of it, too. And um, so it's that humility, but also just. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really like uh, listening. I think listening is so vitally important. I get I get invited in and I don't I don't go into community unless I'm invited. And I'll give you another small example. But here we recently just established an Indigenous community, uh, an Indigenous center at Bishop's University, which has been around for two years. And, you know, I may, I say, look, you know, I make myself known. I, I, I introduce myself. And I say, this is the work I do. But Unless they, uh, unless I'm called in, I, I won't go. And, and and I got eventually after some time, I got called in, and and then I started doing that kind of work. But um, it's really important that you just listen and you wait to be invited. For me, I, yeah, that that's excellent. And I, I there's another student, uh, another 
another question in the chat by a student, which I think ties into that. So I'll take that and then Justin, and I see two hands up too. So here, the other student, Brittany, is asking, is there any advice you have for settler students to do before engaging in research with Indigenous communities? So what would you tell a new student, essentially? And what questions should they ask themselves to ensure that they are encouraging respect at all times? I think it speaks a bit to what you've already been talking about. It, it really is. I mean, but I, it not it's a good question, but also to to reemphasize um, for me. And I I know that the researchers will go in, they step into community, and they do the work, and then they they you know, and then it it's the relationships is a little bit more transient than. And, and sometimes that's good. Like sometimes some, you know, community just needs someone to come in to do a specific kind of research in whatever community it is, just to do a specific kind of research because they need that data, they need that information. Um, but if, if there is a student coming in uh, wanting to do this kind of work, this is why I have internships at the Center for Justice Exchange is that you could have to come in and do the work, right? So it's, it's important that you learn about um, you learn about that sphere. You learn about uh, what your where your place is in that, and you know what you can contribute, and some of the items and, and elements that are that are uh, part of part of that work before you just start studying people. Because that's not what we're doing, right? We're studying situations, but you want to make sure you're going in very well prepared. So I don't. Um, there's a lot of mentoring that happens if I'm working with, I, for me, it would be working with a student under my um, supervision where it, if, and if we're working on the Understanding Justices project together that, you know, and they do, they do long-term uh, work for, for, for years, like for two years for the uh, tenure of their, for their master's program, for example. But that's, that's how I, I mean, just to step into it, like um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't do it that way. Thank you. Um, so, Justin. Okay. Uh, hi, Vicky. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. I mean, these are really important questions that you're uh, going over and stuff that I'm grappling with in my work, too. Um, I guess I, I just had a question about the, the idea of harm. And um, I guess my question is, what do you th how do you navigate this as a researcher it could be like indigenous or non-indigenous researcher when you're working with indigenous peoples or in indigenous communities um when you encounter uh maybe something you disagree with with that community and mm -hmm. where maybe the researcher thinks that something is harmful but the community does not think it's harmful or vice versa um i guess like th does that make sense so for example um there are you know some indigenous so i don't agree with everything about the national inquiry recommendations, like some of them call for uh, harsher punishments or, or various things. Um, and if you encounter Indigenous peoples or communities that you there's the researcher disagree with, like, how do you, I guess, navigate that? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and there's so many levels there uh, of harm. Like, I mean, if I'm, if I, I, there's a lot of conversation. It's a lot, I mean, if you if you do community work, like you would know, Justin, that you do community work, it's it's a lot of talking, it's a lot of conversation, it's a lot of tr like trust building, it's a lot of relationship. So, um, and I and I think that's one thing that folks don't probably understand in doing this work. So that when I come across something harmful, you know, in the prison community, like all kinds of harms that happen, and. Um, I, I I have long, long conversations and I keep talking about it, especially if I feel like, um, especially if I feel like, uh, so for example, some of the violence that's happening in prison uh, between folk, between the guys inside. So I, I have long conversations about that and what that looks like and how, you know, um, with how they feel about it. And it's just on the phone when they call me or whatever, whatever the case may be. So it's not even, that's not part of my research. I'm not even, to be honest, I'm not even researching that, that in particular, but I'm just talking on the phone about it because it's something that in my, I feel like um, in my work and with the knowledge that I have, I have, uh, I, I have certain principles and, and anti-violence is one of them. And so there's some, there's hard, some hard lines that I'll, that I'll draw, but if it's something a little bit, you know, like I, I, 
we go back and forth a lot on human rights discourses and whether or not human rights are going to be helpful in for advancing this approach. Um, I won't, so what I do in my work, I articulate uh, my position and why, and then we talk about it. And usually it's with the people that I'm already in community with. And then if they um, if they want to do continue that work, there's different routes that they can do it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to pick it up in my work. That's and it's not ideal. And this is again goes back to the, the conflicts and tensions and whatnot that happen all the time. And then sometimes I come around and say I was wrong, and sometimes they come around and say they were wrong. You know. Yeah, it's a good, really good question though. It, it, is, it is a messy terrain, like like the, the my last tenant. Like it just, it's a messy terrain, and there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of answers, more questions than answers. Yeah. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah. Okay, I'll uh, take Leanne's question from the chat, and then Isabel, you'll be next. Um, so Leanne on the chat um, says, thanks for sharing, Vicky. Are there any methodological challenges in terms of collecting and analyzing data within traditional methods as opposed to indigenous approaches? And how do you reconcile these? Yeah, yeah, great. God, you guys are really good questions. Okay. So like I'll give you the interesting justices piece. So I feel like there's there's a lot of um there's a lot of things that that research can do and so in the the interesting justice piece like I don't do quant methods whatsoever but I feel like we need to have that so that we have a good overview of cuz we collected over 500 plus but my my astrophysics friends tells me <laughs> to me that's big data my astrophysics friends tell me that's nothing but anyway um uh, so yeah, so we brought in someone who does quantitative methods to help us get a different reorientation and to see things a little bit differently, things that I can't see when you're in it. And then, uh, then my own work when I'm doing my, you know, when I'm doing writing up my reports or writing up uh, my research or articles, um, it's not necessarily my articles is what benefits the communities directly. You know, it's, 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 I'm, I, I do a lot of work around concepts of justice or reconceptualizing justice. So it's to reorient mainstream and academic work around, um, around these concepts of justice and, or an ontology of justice. And so, but then there's research that does directly benefit the communities. And so we, for me, that, that is, it's always, it's three tiered. Like, so this partnership, we we're working with, uh, quite a few, um, quite a few indigenous partners, and we were we've done individual in one-on-one -on -one interviews with them and focus groups to learn what do you need this website to do, and some of them need this website to have research or a place where they can uh, find something. Some of it, some of them just need like immediate an immediate resource. Some of them talked about wanting um, to bring down the silos and all the work that they're doing. So um, that kind of, I feel like you can bring different methodologies to meet different ends. Because the, one of the good things that I love about research, and it, I've worked in NGOs, uh, non-government organizations. I even worked in, with the government. I, I actually worked in parole, uh, with Correctional Services Canada in parole services for a while. And I, I have to be honest, academia was the was the one place where I felt like I could mobilize my work in innovative and dynamic ways. So, um, and if if a methodology doesn't work for you, just invent one. <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, but collaborative methodologies is a little bit is like um, a kind of methodology that I'm working with. And it's not necessarily, I mean, it's new. I mean, this is academia is always building off of each other's work anyway. It's not like I'm inventing anything new, but it's reorienting it in a different way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Isabel. <laughs> Hi, Vicki. It's so nice to see you again. Hey, Isabel. Thank you everyone else. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I've learned a lot. Um, so one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about over many years, but especially um, in my position now, is um, thinking about my identity and position as a settler and what commitments that I've made to Indigenous peoples and communities and how I will enact these roles and responsibilities like within the university setting and beyond. 
So one of the ways that um, I'm currently uh, doing this is through um, co-leading and co-chairing uh, an indigenizing and decolonizing criminology committee at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. And so in this um, working mission that we're starting with, um, we're talking about like, what are some different goals? What are some different things that we envision? And if all this relates to your talk is when you were talking about um, the importance of not only doing good, um, but in, in terms of lessening the harm to Indigenous uh, peoples and communities. So I feel like I have, you know, a decent understanding of why these different components are important, um, but I'm wondering if you can spend a little bit of time explaining a bit more about why is it so important to emphasize um, lessening harm to Indigenous peoples instead of just doing good? Okay, if I, um, so the question is uh, just to, to talk a little bit more about lessening harm. And then uh, doing this work as a settler. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And for me, it, it really, it's a, it really, a really important question because um, I can't, I can't, I can't make any claims that I don't do harm. I can't, I can't 100% claim that. And you know, um, there, there's things that probably happen that, um, creates a tension between groups and all of a sudden, it, you know, as a result of the work that's happened. So we can't really know for sure how, if, um, if I'm doing harm. Uh, and, and I think that's important that I recognize that. So uh, to, but to, to try to do less harm is, I, I don't see, I, I don't see my role in, in community as, as central. Um, I always see it as kind of on the periphery. And, and that as I, I think one of the, the main roles I take in my work is witnessing and documenting. And when I project my work into the world, you know, you know, we were talking about an article, like I'll often look at the system itself and what the system's doing. So that I, and I'll never speak to what Indigenous, like who they are and what they're doing. For example, the Unearthing Justice Program uh, project, it's what I'm learning from Indigenous communities to help me reconceptualize justice for the mainstream. And, is, and my God, even that could be seen as cultural appropriation of some sort, you know. But I still think that we, you know, I, you know in, this, in this journey, I've, I've learned so much. And I feel like, wow, you know, mainstream knowledge could benefit so much from this, this kind of under these kinds of understandings and insights. And in talking with community, they agree, like they don't see that kind of work as hostile or impeding on the, the work that they're already doing and what they need for themselves. And, you know, so um, that's how I see it. I, I see really research shouldn't intervene in community only to support in a ways that the research itself uh, as as a process or as a product or as a tool can can be helpful or support or give them what they're what they're requesting or needing but for me to come in with a kind of framework to orient indigenous communities is absolutely not my place and goes vitally against indigenous uh, intellectual sovereignty and um, self-determination so I, I don't know if that's clear. I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, so much of this is hard to articulate, but if you, part of one of my barometers to know if I'm doing harm or not is when I get, if I get invited into, back into community. You know what I mean? So that's like, if, if, if uh, as, as we work forward and I articulate my, my, my position and my, my, my feelings and my, my thoughts around things, and, and they still see that as viable and important that I keep getting invited back in. That's my, that's kind of my barometer, but it's not necessarily the best barometer, but it's one. I mean, I could go on and on. I could sit and talk about this all day, but I, I actually like the unknowing around it because it, I find it's really, um, it just keeps me guessing and I'm not, I don't get to, uh, I get, I don't get to just assume all the time my, my role as kind of the authority and, in this yeah anyway <laughs> thank you and i think your your answer really spoke to the importance of relationality okay right? being invited back you know mm -hmm. thank yeah you fair play. thanks for that actually yeah 
Thank you. And I am conscious of time, but we will have time, I think, for two more questions before the hour is up. Um, so I do see, and I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Kinan. Your hand is up. Correct. Uh, thank you very much, Vicky, for this, like, uh, very... Uh, I think I think we can't hear you. Your speaker cut out. Yeah. Okay, I think she's trying. Oh, can to... you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah uh, so uh, I really appreciate that you shared with us the uh, the the mistakes that uh, you uh, encounter uh, and challenges that you encounter. Uh, and I do believe that in in every research there there is some messiness. <laughs> and some researchers uh, like to polish their research and hide this messiness, mm -hmm. and uh, others believe that this messiness and research is useful for the others, and we need to report uh, these mistakes, challenges, and how we uh, responded to them. We need to report them in our research procedure, uh, results, and so on, so other people can benefit from our experience. So from your experience, uh, do you think it is important or useful to report these mistakes or challenges in our research or to hide them? Yeah, wow, what an interesting question. Um, I don't to, I, I don't report on that. I for me, and I feel like that's a kind of violation of trust if I were to talk about the um, inner workings or the insider knowledge of of that of that kind of work. Um, but I guess it depends on what it is. I mean, I'm happy to report on some of my own mistakes just as a learning uh, moment. But no, I, I, I haven't really thought about it so much uh, of reporting it I, not or hiding it, just not talking about it, <laughs> selectively, selectively talking about things. But yeah, actually, interesting question. I, I, I'll have to give that some more thought. Thank you. Yeah, because it's, this is happening also in quantitative research. Researchers tend to hide the messiness and polish their research. Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I got to think about that. There's like, because there's a political statement there too that you're teasing out. Yeah. Thank you. And Emily, you will have the very last question. <laughs> so, no pressure. No. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for your talk, Vicky. It was really great. Um, as someone who really is interested in doing community work and research, I found your talk super interesting. I have so much, maybe a broader, a basic question, but I'd love to hear your insights around maybe doing research uh, with groups that are over represented or in research or over research and kind of how you enter that space with care, I guess, or that, you know, if you've been advice for a newbie <laughs> like me that maybe is going into these spaces and doing research. And I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be with Indigenous communities, but just I think also to just people who are incarcerated tend, at least I've heard from um, from folks that I've worked with that they tend to feel over research. So I just would love to hear your insights around that. I guess, yeah, good, yeah, really good question. I guess it's important. I mean, it's important to find out what's needed in community, like what you know, we're going with these ideas of what, what we need to be studying and thinking about. Like when I went into, like, you know, when I when I went into this work, it was really about anti-violence and how can we reduce the violence and support, the, you know, support the, the, the women in two-spirit experiencing the violence. And I came out thinking like, whoa, like this is, I have so much to learn here. <laughs> like, you know, I have so much, there's so much resource and so much to learn here. So it was like, when you that's why I say you have to be you have to be in community invited into community and find your it has to make a space for you that's why I say that 
but I'll give you an example. Like, like when this, when, when doing land acknowledgements and indigenizing the academy became, was starting to get gain, gaining popularity. And, you know, it's on one hand, I know people mean well and they, and they, and they do want things to be better, but on the other hand, there's, there's a bit of a, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a, you know, uh, uh, business, business at play, where they're, they're trying to do some kind of like these kinds of grabs on money and whatnot. And, and um, so, land, yeah, so land acknowledgements were becoming really important and someone uh, came up to me knowing, and you know, all of a sudden my work became really interesting <laughs> in my institution, but um, th they're like, oh, can you find us someone to do a land acknowledgement? Can you find us an Indigenous person to do a land acknowledgement? And my response was no, no. And I, first of all, I'm I my community's prison community and MMIW community or M Two Spirit, and um, and and I haven't done well. I, I have Abenaki friends and I've I, you know and the like, but I I haven't stepped into that community yet, nor have I been invited. And so, and if you're asking me to do that then that tells me you haven't done the work yet and you you aren't in really you haven't done any relationship building yet so you when like if you don't if you want to step into community for me it's like you go in and be like what can i do how can i volunteer and like when i went to prison community it was that that's what i did i i volunteered i worked with folks inside and i just talked to them listen see what they needed we did a, we ended up doing a community presentation kind of some of the similar stuff you're already doing emily but, you know, and, and I think that's how you step into it. And then as you grow an awareness of what's needed, you start to see your role a little bit more in terms of, so it's, it, it grows. And I know that it doesn't, that doesn't meet the needs of research and certainly like uh, graduate work, but um, yeah, you can just ask. I think you can just ask if you find yourself in community and I, I'm pretty sure you, you are like you have a community and, and then it takes all kinds it'll take you in all kinds of different routes and then you just need to figure like just harness and see those connections and those interconnections yeah I mean I feel I feel like I could maybe we could have a side conversation around that no for sure thank you yeah thanks Emily Hey, thank you so, so much, Vicky, for your time, for your excellent talk and uh, all your patience in the Q&A. There were lots of questions, lots of oh, interest good. today. Um, good questions, yeah. Also, um, the the uh, video will be on our YouTube channel. So for folks who missed it, um, they may have a chance to watch it after. Um, but thank you so, so much. And I do uh, want to remind everyone that our next talk will be a little bit different. Um, it'll actually be a book um, tour of uh, Benjamin Pe Perrin, uh, who will be um, who will be talking about his uh, book Indictment: uh, The Criminal Justice System on Trial, mm -hmm. alongside Petra Schulz, who is the, uh, one of the founders of Mom Stop the Harm. Um, and that will be happening on Monday, November 27th. Um, it will be an, a hybrid event. Um, so you will have the chance to watch it online on our YouTube channel, but you can also come to the Center for Criminological Research in person. And I will be sending out emails and on all the social media channels, et cetera, um, announce that talk as well. Uh, so I hope to see many of you there. Um, thank you again, Vicky. And to everyone in the audience and to you obviously have a wonderful day yeah thanks everyone this was amazing you guys are you guys are great thanks <laughs>